Great. Yeah. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome folks online. And yeah, for folks, if you haven't been to this space before, there are cushions, there are blankets. You are, you're welcome to actually sit um, around here if you'd like on the floor. Uh, of course, in the chair is fine as well. And we are, yeah, just so delighted to be here together on solstice, kind of auspicious that the Wednesday night fell on this day uh, and long night. And Chandra and I are excited this evening to continue moving forward in story time for those who've been here the last couple of weeks. Very sweet to be reading this uh, historical account of the life of the Buddha and really getting a sense of the richness of how um, Siddhartha became an enlightened being. So instead of, again, just thinking about these teachings as existing as truths throughout time, really considering how did Siddhartha become awakened? What were the kind of ingredients and factors that led towards this experience of waking up and seeking a different way of life? And now we've mo noticed the last chapters up until now, we see that there's a lot of awareness and waking up to the conditions of uh, inequality, oppression, and just all the ways that this very privileged prince was seeing how the world was not equal for everyone. And not only was it not equal for everyone, that everyone was suffering. And tonight, when we look a bit more and learning about kind of what goes on in the palace, it's not all dancing girls and tapestries. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of very beautiful experiences in the palace of uh, young Siddhartha, but there's also a lot of corruption and difficulty and pain. And that is one of the factors that allows us to start to understand why this brave young prince decided to leave everything. Spoiler alert, but you probably already knew that. <laughs> and find this new way and then have the incredible experience of thousands of years of these teachings being passed down till this moment tonight and when Chandra and I were speaking about today and um, teaching on the solstice I was sharing with her I, I felt a little embarrassed I felt like a very kind of um, dorm room um, I said dorm room maybe like thong hit realization but mm -hmm of just thinking, you know, that this is marking this one day on this 365 day orbit of this little blue green marble that's also spinning thousands of miles an hour. And just really that larger view we can take on a night like the solstice, like really understanding not just the day to day of like, what am I having for dinner? And you know, what are the relative reality things I need to attend to, but wow. Like here we are celebrating this experience of being on a planet orbiting around the sun with many other planets orbiting at their different speeds and rates. And this single day, our longest day, we kind of bring attention to just that wider view. And we were talking how we can kind of consider that wider view, like our wider view of compassion. And tonight in these chapters, we see how the wider view and understanding of the cycles of suffering is really what allows us to show up for compassion each day, each moment. So we'll take this wider view of our year and the many years that some of us have experienced more than others, but solstice every year and taking that moment to really um, think about what this means for our planet and all of us. So with that, maybe we'll do announcements at the end sure. with the... Um, other fun, festive, mm -hmm. yeah, make sure people don't slip out the door. So we have fun things, have fun things at the end. Mm -hmm. So with that, Chandra, we'll hand it over to you. Uh-oh. Thank you, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Eve. I wish I could be there with you all in person. I was planning on it, but I, I have a occasional nerve uh, back pain. And so I'm in a moment of that. And so sitting in cars and even sitting in a chair is not easy for me right now. So I have to minimize the amount of, of travel I do coming from the East Bay, you know, into San Francisco, not, not always as easy as I would like. Uh, so 
again, wishing that, you know, I could be there in person, but I'm so glad that Eve could hold it down in person for everybody who's there. And then we have this wonderful community online as well. So yeah, this is our solstice time. We have these beautiful lights strewn up behind Eve. And I will also turn off a light or two of mine in my little office so that I can feel um, this sort of womb-like experience I'd love to invite us to have as we do this meditation together. I'll guide about a 30-minute sit, and then Eve will guide the discussion on our chapters here in the Old Path White Clouds book. Um, so go ahead and make yourself comfortable. Yeah, turn off your your lights. If you want to, even in your room at home, if you have a little candle, if you want to light a candle, you could do that or light some incense even. That's easy and, and close by. You could do that. Um, so today is the, the longest night, shortest day, but we shift. It's the juncture of moving into longer days now. So I was reflecting on that yesterday and today, feeling a little caught off guard, like, wait a minute, I'm not ready. <laughs> I want more hibernation. Uh, but that's just a, you know, a silly uh, form of attachment, but also an honest and authentic one of um, let's savor this time together, this this long, dark night where we can be cozy in our little meditation shawls in our in our dorm room with our... <laughs> I won't say that. <laughs> um, and, you know, do whatever you got to do, but uh, get cozy and feel that warmth that is generated through what's called tapas, which is a spiritual a heat that we generate through practice. And in particular, tapas, T-A-P-A-S, is a common yogic word, but it's also found in in um, tantric buddhism is the heat that is generated through discipline not a, a rigid discipline but through staying staying present staying with the breath staying with the awareness of the mind or whatever it is you're focusing on that that staying power builds a warmth and that warmth is a has a purifying effect and so that's why we do this, not because of some, you know, punishment or should, you know, uh, rule, but because through experience, we have that inner heat, like the candle that Maria is holding in, the, in her video here, that lights up within us, within our central channel, our central axis. So it's, that's what we'll cultivate tonight in our practice. So go ahead now and settle in. And let's begin by closing our eyes and turning inward that inner outer space, that the illusion of it being small and confined can break down. And as you breathe, feel the breath moving through that cosmic space, like Eve instigated this amazing feeling of perspective we are spinning as we circumambulate the sun and that we are within that space and that space is within us so begin to soften more deeply with each out breath it might be nice to to mute, I don't know, mute the um, the room if that's an easy thing for somebody to do. If not, it's not a big deal. And take a moment to give rise to your own personal heartfelt motivation for your practice, for your life, especially at this juncture of moving into from darkness into light. Reflecting on the year to come, but also reflecting on the year that has passed.
and finding yourself in this moment. And even if all you have in this moment is the breath in the darkness, can you be grateful for that? Can you feel the abundance of that, the wholeness, the completeness of it? And of this moment, the completeness of this breath, And not only upon this global marble spinning through space, but also this particular patch of land that you find yourself on, acknowledging the land that we tread upon, that we sleep upon, we live, eat, laugh and cry and dance upon. Give thanks to your ancestors, the family line, but also the spiritual line, teachers and mentors. This, holding this in within your bodhicitta prayer. This aspiration to practice for the benefit of yourself and others within the spirit of gratitude. And then let's spend some time practicing our familiar mindfulness of breathing and let the breath be like velvet in the body with each in and out breath, smoothing out the rough edges, the jagged, sharp textures with each breath slowly whittling down and feeling the breath like a velvet smooth softness nourishing replenishing you as you breathe in feel it whether it's short or deep long or shallow relish in the smooth texture the nourishing texture of the breath and the breathing out is a releasing that which you don't need to hold anymore, a letting go. The inhale is a nourishment. And the exhale is a shedding away, softening and opening. And spaciousness. And in the spirit of this tapas, the inner heat, this breath helps to create that friction, giving rise to a warmth within you. And when the mind alights upon the breath, the warmth is even greater. Whereas if the mind is drifting and untethered, distracted, the warmth is more diffuse. It's just simple, uncomplicated. See if you can tether the mind more closely, like a love story, the union of the mind and the breath, creating that warmth of tapas, the inner heat, the inner candlelight within you.
the in-breath oxygenating, nourishing that light, and the out-breath diffusing and spreading that warmth throughout the body. The mind drifts off, drifts off. You know, it's like a balloon with a long string. Just slowly reel it back in. Reel the mind gently back in, holding it close to the breath. Maintaining that warmth of concentration. you wish, you may anchor the mind in the belly, feel the rise and fall of the breath in the belly, that helps you. As the in-breath draws in, the belly might expand or soften a bit. As the breath leaves the body, the belly relaxes, deflates a bit. Just let it feel natural if it's helpful. Rest the attention at the breath in the belly. If not, just maintain the quality of the texture of the breath as it flows in and out of the body. Releasing distraction with the out breath. And feel the body aligned with gravity Tension releasing out of the shoulders, out of the face, throat, the belly, the low back and hips. Let yourself rest at ease.
And now continuing with this theme of the inner light. We'll continue to practice shamatha, but now shifting the object to an inner luminosity, a little flame within you at your navel center. But first imagine that from the base of the perineum rises up a central channel, a funnel of light your central channel rising up, running along just in front of the spinal column, and then terminating in a thousand petaled lotus at the crown of the head. Feel it effervescent, fine and immaterial, the circumference of your thumb. a funnel of light from the base of the spine all the way up to the crown of the head. The base is like a little bulb, like a a narcissist bulb. And then the central channel is like the stalk of that narcissist. And then the crown chakra is like the flowering. Take a few breaths, just feeling that potential. It's It's a subtle, energetic experience, not material. Subtle body anatomy. Even if you see it in your mind's eye or have a, a distant inkling of feeling it, seeing or feeling is fine, both. Let the intuitive faculty, trust that whatever you experience is correct, is good. And then now imagine that within that central channel, four finger widths below the level of your navel and right in the center of the central channel is a little candle flame. This is like the seed of the the dumo, the inner heat, the chandali. And as you breathe in, feel the breath entering the body and traveling down the central channel, oxygenating that little flame at the navel. And then as you exhale, the flame kind of sparks a bit and warms you, warms the hara, the navel. And that warmth spreads down, but also mainly up through the central channel, through the crown and beyond. So the in-breath is drawing the breath down and in, touching that candle flame. It's four finger widths below the navel in the central channel. And the exhalation is a spreading of that heat. So let that be your anchor. The in-breath, drawing the breath down through the central channel where it kisses the flame. The flame sparks a bit, responds, And then the heat as you exhale spreads throughout the body, throughout the central channel and beyond. Be soft with the visualization, feeling rather than fixating on getting the image perfect. You may feel a building of warmth at the navel center. Perhaps that warmth is spreading to the low back, the kidneys, the front body, side body, the pelvic floor, the genitals, then up through the solar plexus, the heart, the lungs. Feel that warmth permeating the organs of the torso.
As you breathe, the warmth spreads further up through the body, up through the throat, melting any stagnancy or constriction through speech at the throat and the neck. And the warmth, as it does, rises up into the mind, the brain, into that thousand-petaled lotus where it blooms. <clears throat> and that's your bridge to the heavens. Feel that lotus blooming and opening to the light of the stars, sun and moon. So continue like this. Inhale, breathing down. Let the breath kiss that flame within the central channel, four finger widths below the navel. The exhale, the heat, that warmth of the flame spreads up through the central channel, down, and then throughout the whole body. We'll practice in silence.
And now within the spirit of this expansive space on a cosmic level, with the imagination, the sky is the limit. And so the next step is expanding the size of the central channel. Rather than the central channel just being within you, now expand the central channel so that you are within the central channel, that it's large enough to contain you. So feel it expanding until you find yourself within that luminous funnel of blissful light. pervaded by the warmth, the luminosity of the Kundalini Shakti, the Chandali energy. And to get even more psychedelic, let's expand it even more now so that the central channel is as large as the universe, that the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, all of us are within the central channel. Don't overthink it, just feel it. It's playing with the sense of time and space large and small, here and there. Crack that open and experience your central channel as wide as the cosmos, as vast as you can imagine, that everything is within it and that you are within everything. And then dissolving that visualization and just resting in the presence of the breath and the body again. And simply free of visualization, just feel the warmth within you, even if it's just a small degree, the beating heart of the texture and the friction of the breath and the body creating the warmth metabolism within you. And I'd like to end the meditation with a prayer and offering. And I invite you to simply listen to it. I'll repeat it three times. It's in Sanskrit. And it's a prayer to the goddess as Narayani, she who protects and saves beings from foundering in the ocean of samsara, the darkness of ignorance,
may we be blessed by the goddess, whether it's through the inner heat of Dumo, which literally means the fierce mother, or the universal womb of totality, the great mother. May she hold us in her loving embrace. Sharanagata dinarta paritrana parayane sarvasyarti hare devi narayani namostute Sharanagata dinarta paritrana parayane Sarvasyarti Hare Devi Narayani Namostute Sharanagata Dinarta Paritrana Parayane Sarvasyarti Hare Devi Narayani Namostute When you're ready, slowly begin to open your eyes. Come back into the space with each other. If you would like to turn on the light, you can. If not, that's fine too. It's up to you all. And uh, as we shift before the discussion, there's this nice bardo time, this intermediary time to speak from experience, to ask questions, to share um, anything about the meditation that feels uh, um, like it wants to come into the space together. So if you wish, you can uh, raise your hand. Eve can moderate that in the room, or um, I don't know who's our online moderator, but the online, maybe Jason or somebody here can help us. You can raise your digital hand and unmute, ask your question. Okay. Thank you, Chandra, for the beautiful practice. You're welcome. You inspired any, your dorm <laughs> room <questions>? things. No. No, sounds like me. <laughs> Any questions from <laughs> whose laugh was that? <laughs> Any questions from folks here? I this could have been for some people the first time they've done visualization or central channel. Um, yeah. So it's good to get thrown into the deep end. <laughs> Um, there, I'm That's sure any simple. question that anybody has here would be one that would be a benefit for everyone. So please feel free to ask questions about the practice. I see a chat from Denise saying, thank you. That sure helped my low back pain. Good. Yeah. I helped mine too. That yeah. was a, believe it or not, a simplified version of the central, a central channel. There's not just one, you know, there are many ways that the central channel can be brought into meditation practice so that one that i shared stems from the tibetan yogic uh, tradition that i learned through the nyingma tradition and from tolku sangha Grimpshe, but it was very simplified it's not the whole kit and caboodle 
but it doesn't take much, right? It doesn't take much to, but I'd be curious to see how that landed with people. The tapas. I think that's a neat, a good theme for us, Eve. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, Generating the inner heat. That's right. Mm -hmm. Discipline, which, you know, gets a bad rap, but they say, you know, that actually that the discipline brings freedom, right? We think of discipline, at least I do. I tend to think of discipline as a bit confining <laughs> or limiting or like a prison, maybe, you know, you have to do something. But in so, when it's done, just, you know, in a, in a skillful way, it brings about freedom. Hmm. It can bring about freedom. There's an old story about, about um, that, which I won't go into right now because it's question time. <laughs> Any questions or reflections on the practice, the inner flame, and expanding out? I see Nick online. Hi, thanks for the meditation, and it was lovely. Um, it's kind of a kind of a mind blowing. I, I I like the expansion of the central channel and the and the that metaphor. Um, and you know it's been kind of chilly lately and cold in the city. So yeah. what came to mind? Um, I kind of chuckled a little bit. I thought, yes, it's a, like a pilot light in the water heater. <laughs> you mm, know, right. pilot pilot light goes out, we're in trouble. You know. Yes. <laughs> so I kind of felt I got that kind of a feeling. You know, and I, okay, let, let's let's stay with this and see what happens. And then from there, you kind of built on it and stuff that I. It's like I couldn't imagine. It, it just was really great. And um, and also in the beginning, you talked about um the uh feeling of the velvet, you know, the mm -hmm. velvet breathing. And I thought, oh, okay, the velvet. I usually sometimes I'll think like silk. Yeah. But yeah, silk or velvet thread. Oh, yeah, that's really nice, you know. It's really mm -hmm. smooth. And and it kind of like uh, you know, like a bellows and to keep the fire going. You know, the yeah. breath kind of the oxygen keeps the fire going. So I think it was perfect and, and really, you know, timely, you know, due to the to the chilliness in the air. <laughs> so thanks. Okay, good, good. Pilot light. Yes. Perfect analogy. That's what it is. That's what that little flame is. Hmm. Pilot light. Yeah. And usually I say silk, too. Honestly, I didn't. I, I Velvet kind of just came out and I was like, it, that's exactly the feeling that I'm feeling right now is the velvet. Not sometimes it's silk sometimes it's velvet sometimes it's leather sometimes it's lace <laughs> but the, tonight it was velvet you know it's, it's warmer maybe like cashmere <laughs> too could be a good texture that velvet's pretty cool good thanks nick anyone else Okay. So if there's nothing else that wants to be shared, uh, Eve, love to. Yeah. To yeah. And I will um, continue to weave in. We're so fortunate uh, to have Chandra here. And like, I always love so much when we get to teach together because there's a uh, wisdom traditions coming together. Some of you know, we share a couple primary teachers and then we have a lot of, uh, kind of wild seeds elsewhere. So it's always really rich. And I, as we move in, I love teaching with you. Hmm. Learning from you. And yeah. I think it's a, it's a nice way to hear different perspectives of different teachers and different um, yeah experiences. And as we move into the discussion time here, just a reminder that, you know, as the Dharma collective, one thing we really prioritize is creating a space where folks as much as possible can feel safe. We, we can't ensure that, we can't enforce that. But our goal is that we are really enacting our compassionate listening and our compassionate speech so that we're treating not just the time we did the beautiful meditation as our practice, but truly this entire time together as practice. And a lot of that is really, um, it's in a way kind of leaning back as we listen, trying something on as though it were new. And when we hear other people speak, we're really listening, not with a kind of uh, as much as possible, not with a idea of what we want to say next or an idea that, 
why did they say it that way? I would never say it that way. Really just this practice of listening fully and receiving. And it's such an amazing thing that we get to practice in community. Um, it's truly a catalytic part of this whole process of waking up, becoming more clear on what is in the way of our uh, true compassion and awareness, infiltrating every aspect of our life is practicing together because we live together. We live in community. And it's really wonderful if you have a 50 day streak on your insight timer and you're just like on it. But if you're not practicing with other people, there's going to be a limit to how much these teachings will transform you. And so part of the benefit of practicing together is not only, you know, hearing each other breathe, which is you know, after the pandemic, it's so cool to be in the room with other people practicing, but also listening and using this time together to notice that there are different lived experiences. There are different ideas. And that sense that we are really contributing here together to this process of a shared desire to wake up for the sake of all beings. It's really like, what's the other option? If there was anything else that we could do to alleviate our own and other suffering, we should definitely do it because this is the hard way, right? <laughs> it's really hard to settle the mind. It's really hard to have compassion and forgiveness, but there's no other way. There's no other way. And doing it together is just truly, um, it's essential. So yeah. And as many of you know, but if, is there anyone here that's their first time? There's some folks I don't recognize. Yay! Welcome, friends. Uh, so the Dharma Collective is an entirely volunteer-run organization. We have many of the people who are on the board and run the organization here, and everybody comes here to create a space that's shared together. So it's really unique, especially, I say this a lot, but in San Francisco, in this day and age, to be somewhere where we're just all intentionally here without capitalism. Yeah. Like, wow. Um, you know, it's just an amazing, um, yeah, just a different energy. There's a lot of things that work well with capitalism and <laughs> a lot of things that are nice to do in an alternative model. So yeah, welcome to the Dharma Collective for those who are new. And I want to um, get us started here with story time. So again, this is a collected series of stories that Thich Nhat Hanh put together for us to be able to understand the life of the Buddha and all that he experienced and learned along the way. And where we left off last week was these teachings on, um, you know, just beneath the rose apple tree. So this is a 11 year old Siddhartha who's recognizing that even amid great celebrations, it was a plowing celebration that there can be suffering. The little worms are dying, the little birds that are coming to eat the worms are being eaten by bigger birds and the actual conventions of society that have been created to do a blessing on this plowing of the land. They don't help the worms and the birds. So Siddhartha is seeing here that some of the conventional structures, the spiritual structures of the day actually aren't addressing the true root causes of suffering. And this little being, like many of us as little beings, recognizes injustice. And so last week, we kind of shared about when did we have that experience of seeing the way the world was working and feeling, wait, it sh it's not, it shouldn't be like this. Like, Siddhartha, especially as it's written here and many other texts, he's exceptional, right? He's the best athlete. He's the best looking. He's the most well-read. He can, you know, shoot the sun out of the sky and catch it in a basket. But there's a lot of things that are really relatable about, you know, especially his early life experiences and kind of feeling into the world. And um, yeah, there's uh, the next part is, you know, really this interesting push and pull between Siddhartha and his father. Um, his father had been given this kind of premonition when he was born that this was going to be a great spiritual teacher. And the king said, oh, no, like I need a successor. Someone's got to run this land. I don't need a spiritual teacher. And so he always has in the back of his mind, like, what are we going to do to make sure Siddhartha doesn't go, you know, on the path wandering. And in this chapter, chapter seven, uh, which is strangely called White Elephant Prize. 
we didn't really figure out if that has anything to do with the white elephant gift thing today. <laughs> but this was one of, um, you know, the king's plan of finding Siddhartha a wife so that he would once and for all give up on his questioning and, you know, settle down, get into conventional reality and stop with all your dreaming about waking up. Um, so let's see here. We are on chapter um, seven. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I read a little bit of this last time. It's really interesting, right? There's a number of levels at which um, Siddhartha is kind of poking or um, wanting to more deeply investigate the structures and systems of his time. And one of it is with, with Brahmanism. Right, the kind of dominant um, spiritual practices of this time. And the Brahmin were literally their own class, right? They were above others. Um, and he, and in a lot of cases, Siddhartha became really interested in going out and learning more about how people understood Brahmanism. And he, in this part, it says, Siddhartha learned that there were a number of movements in the country which openly challenged the absolute authority of Brahmins. Members of these movements were not only discontented laymen who wished to share some of the power that had long belonged exclusively to the Brahmin caste, but they included reform-minded members of the Brahmin caste as well. Since the day young Siddhartha had been given permission to invite a few poor country children to his royal picnic, he had also been allowed to visit from time to time the small villages that surrounded the capital. On these occasions, he was always careful to wear simple garments. And speaking directly with the people, he learned many things that had never been exposed to in the palace. He was aware, of course, that people served and worshipped the three deities of Brahmanism, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. But he also learned that they were manipulated and oppressed by the Brahma priests. In order to leave the proper rituals for birth, marriages, and funerals, families were forced to pay the Brahmins in food and money and physical labor, labor regardless of how impoverished they were. And so... This was kind of, you know, again, this one of these catalytic factors that made Siddhartha start to um, be curious, like these structures don't seem to really work for people. They seem to actually be extractive. So I don't know if that relates to anybody in this room. Are we participating in structures that seem extractive that maybe don't even really benefit us? Um, I think that that is something um, that we can relate to on so many levels and this idea of starting to kind of poke into it and especially you know this member of the most elite um Siddhartha liked very much to meet and discuss with hermits and monks but his father disapproved so he had to find excuses to go on other excursions in hope of encountering such men these monks carried nothing for material possessions and social status unlike the brahmins who openly vied for power Rather, these monks abandoned everything in order to seek liberation and cut to the ties that bond them um, in order to seek liberation that it could bound them to the sorrows and worries of the world. They were men who had studied and penetrated the meaning of the Vedas and the Upanishads. He knew that many such hermits lived in Kosala, the neighboring kingdom, and in Magda to the south. He hoped one day he'd have a chance to visit these regions. And, you know, it's... <laughs> Again, whenever um, Siddhartha's father finds out that he's going to visit them, he, he becomes just beside himself with worry. He says, <clears throat> the, country has long, the country of Kasala has long had its eye on our territory. We must count on the talents of the young people, such as Siddhartha, to protect the destiny of our country. I greatly fear he may decide to become a monk. Um, and so as such, they decide to start organizing these events for young people all across the kingdom. And the events are kind of a farce just for young people to meet each other, right? So um, in one case, they are going through a whole like semi like teen Olympics and Siddhartha wins every prize, of course. And he's given this white elephant. Um, but, you know, he enjoys the events and gets along with others, but it's also said that he really finds the palace stifling and he really continues to want to go over and over um, to see different places. 
And one day when he's kind of out and about visiting other places and looking in other towns, he runs into Yaso Dahara. And as some of you know, this will become the Buddha's wife. And what he was really surprised to find her kind of being essentially, you know, a social worker um, into these villages, bringing medical supplies, bringing support, and moreover, kind of bringing her presence. And so, uh, of course, Yaso Dahara was the most beautiful woman in the land. Um, <laughs> but she was dressed simply and... Um, he said that he was deeply moved, Siddhartha was deeply moved to see the daughter of a royal family placing her own comfort aside so she could care for the destitute, rinsing infected eyes and skin, dispensing medicine and washing soiled clothes. Um, and he said, you know, that day really kind of shifted and changed to him. And he discovered that Yasudahara was also not content to be just in her lady's quarters by blindly obeying tradition. Um, and she also had studied the Vedas and secretly opposed the society's injustices. Like Siddhartha, she did not feel truly happy being a privileged member of a wealthy royal family. She loathed the power struggles among the courtiers and even among the Brahmins. She knew that as a woman, she could not affect social change. So she found a ways to express her convictions, her convictions through charitable work. She hoped her friends might see the value of this through her example. So, you know, just a really beautiful setup that this young Siddhartha and Yasudhara find one another, you know, two who it's just like the, you know, how many stories have been like this of people who find themselves drawn to one another and against the conventions of their time. And I think, you know, what is, um, yeah, what is interesting is, we are we're a little get, bit getting set up here because Yasa Dahara is like quite an incredible woman and really generous and charitable. She really supports uh, the Buddha or Siddhartha in finding his way to look towards spiritual teachings, but also she's you know about to be a mother. So in this one chapter, they get married and and also pregnant. So this is in chapter nine. Um, when the Buddha decides that Yasodhara definitively is the only one he should marry. And the whole um, society kind of rises up to celebrate. They have three palaces, one for every season. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. It's, you know, they have fine garments and slippers, fragrant sandalwood lit, um, lit every day. Um, but it says that they weren't moved by the exquisite savory foods and silken clothes. While they could appreciate the artistry of the dancers and musicians, they were not carried away by the pleasures they offered. They had their own dreams to find answers concerning the spiritual quest and renewal of society. And I think again, it's, you know, uh, it certainly is nice to have beautiful items, to be in a beautiful home, have incredible food, entertainment, but have, have you ever been amidst like kind of something that felt very luxurious, very enjoyable and kind of seen just the transitory nature of it, maybe felt the kind of uh, the way I experience it sometimes like greasy, not just the food, <laughs> but it just feels like kind of like, oh, this is this is just a little like rich. It's a little heavy, you know, um, just that feeling of this is not really the ultimate goal. Like, is this really what I'm working towards, what I'm feeling? I know I've, I've shared this story, story here before, but a, a friend of mine who's a, a deep practitioner and teacher in, in Mexico, Julian Veliz, um, said that he knew he was going to become a Dharma practitioner on family vacations because the whole year they saved up money to go on a family vacation. And when they got there, the whole time they were miserable trying to be as happy as they could be. And he just, it was like that, like, there's got to be more, right? There's got to be more. Here we are in this place that we plan to be for the whole year. And yet still, right? There's samsara, there's dissatisfaction. So seeing through and, you know, in the contemporary <clears throat> conditions of our society and culture, we can be entertained and kind of pleased almost nonstop, especially if you like cat videos, 
you know, like there's no limit, right? We can kind of just, you know, indulge, right? Um, indulge ourselves in something that feels good and get a new hit. Like we can really almost entirely avoid like down moments. Um, some folks here know I've, I've taken a couple months off work and it has been yeah, truly awesome. And I have so much more time for the down moments and the uncertainty and the anxiety and the not knowing that's, you know, really easy to bulldoze through when you're working all day and then tending to life and family and then gosh hopefully getting in a night of dharma practice right and um so i don't at all put down this desire to kind of constantly fill our time <clears throat> and it is i think pretty amazing to in in it said uh, later in the text here to see pleasure to its end and to really know that pleasure has an end. It helps us to then not continually seek just more and more pleasure. And somehow um, Siddhartha and Yasu Dahara, you know, they, they saw that clearly. They were onto it. Like this finery, this beautiful music, like, this isn't enough. Like, look at the suffering, you know, look at the suffering everywhere. Um, I'll move ahead just a moment and share um, <clears throat> a little bit about when Siddhartha starts going into the suffering that's actually going on at the highest levels of, of government. Um, so in this time, his father, King Sudhana, expressed the desire to have Siddhartha spend more time at his side so he could instruct his son in, in political and courtly affairs. The prince was invited to attend many official meetings, sometimes alone with the king, other times at the king's court. Siddhartha gave his full attention to these affairs, and he came to understand that the political, economic, and military problems that beset any kingdom had their roots in selfish ambitions of those involved in politics. It's kind of relevant. Um, Concerned only with protecting their own power, it was impossible for them to create enlightened policies for the common good. When Siddhartha saw corrupt officials feign virtue and morality, anger filled his heart, but he concealed it, as he did not have any al <clears throat> alternatives to offer. Why don't you contribute ideas at the court instead of always sitting so silently, King Sudohana asked one day after a long meeting with several officials. Siddhartha looked at his father. It's not that I haven't ideas, but it would be useless to state them. The only point to the they only point to the disease. I do not yet see a cure for selfish ambition of those in the court. Look at Vesamita, for example. He holds an impressive amount of power, yet you know he's corrupt. More than once he's tried to encroach on your authority, but you're forced to depend on his services. Why? Because you know if you don't, chaos will break loose. King Sudana looked at his son silently for a long moment and then spoke. Siddhartha, you know well that in order to maintain peace in one's family and country, there are certain things one must tolerate. My own power is limited, but I am sure if you prepare yourself to be a king, you would do far better than I have. You possess the talent needed to purge the ranks of corruptions while preventing chaos in our homeland. Siddhartha sighed, <clears throat> Father, I do not think it is a question of talent. I believe the fundamental problem is to liberate one's own heart and mind. I'm too trapped by my feelings of anger, jealousy, fear, and desire. Yeah. yeah. So he's really, you know, having this very clear seeing. So seeing it again, you know, in the little villages and towns around the capital, and then seeing it right in the very seat of power, that there's, there's no way to just have this sense of, you know, moving towards justice by one by one trying to dismantle the corruption as you see it. We actually have to dismantle the corruption of the heart, offering a different way, that freedom from jealousy, anger, fear, and desire from those, not that we no longer experience those emotions, but that they're driving how we're acting in the world. Questions, thoughts, reflections on that? I mean, it's so god darn relatable. 
And it's really hard, at least for me, to not fall into a little bit of despair and um, self-indulgent apathy around it. I'm like, oh, this happening at the time of the Buddha? Still happening. Guess we haven't fixed anything, uh, except that now women have power, which is really good. Um, that is a difference from, from this book. But I, I think it can be very easy to feel like these this root of, um, I really like how it's described here, you know, that um, the kind of disease itself is this sense of um, kind of ambition and self-absorption, right? Um, <clears throat> and that without that, the selfish ambition. Um, and it's interesting, you know, we hear, some of us were here and watched the documentary Mission Joy with his Holiness, the Dalai Lama and Bishop Desmond Tutu. And I watched it again the other night with my dad and uh, such a beautiful line in that movie of the Dalai Lama really inviting us to practice wise selfishness, not foolish selfishness. Foolish selfishness is like what's going on in the King's court, trying to get your own and protect your own and ignore the injustice that's going on over here so I can still have what's mine over here. But the kind of wise selfishness of really deeply caring about the well-being of everyone, because that's actually the only way to be free. If we're trying to protect our little safe place, our little, you know, our little kingdom that we have, it's just going to be totally anxiety provoking because right out there is someone who doesn't have it, someone who's not free, someone who's very... Um, desperate and encumbered you know as the great wise man once said more money more problems and it is that sense of you know responsibility and anxiety like the riches that we seek is peace of mind um and and just he's seeing that so clearly and then i think you know one thing that's really interesting um He, he's also saying here, um, yeah, sorry, da, 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 da. yeah, he said Siddhartha had long understood the inner workings of the royal court. Every official was intent on protecting and fortifying his own power, not on alleviating the suffering of those in need. He had seen the powerful plot against each other and felt nothing but revulsion for politics. He knew that even his father's authority was fragile and restricted. The king did not possess true freedom, but was imprisoned by his position. He understood that only when people overcame greed and envy in their own hearts would conditions change. And I think that's interesting. Um, you know, when we think of what would it take to overcome a sense of greed and envy, you know, within our own hearts. So with greed, we have a real sense of, I need more. It, it, it's an insufficient amount that I have. And with envy, it's, I really want what another has. What I have is not enough. And in both cases, it's, it's like the opposite of what Chandra was instructing us to do. Not feeling an inner light. Not feeling that there can be, you know, a richness from within. Um, Chandra, I'm curious hearing about all the perils and um, inequalities in the court, what does the story bring to mind for you? Mm. Oh, I think you're muted. Am I still muted? It's not muted, no, but it's very quiet. quiet. Oh. <laughs> Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it really loud? <laughs> yeah, good. No, probably. Sorry about that. Yeah, you know, it's the, the, the there's also the struggle between, you know, the the your dharma and your karma, right? This uh Buddha or Buddha to be, uh Siddhartha knew that he he needed something um that would help him get free of the internal prison, right? And and yet the father wanted him to do something different. I think we can all 
appreciate that. And perhaps we've lived a similar a similar reality. I had a little bit of that. I'm not in the same <laughs> vein, you know, it wasn't like being a princess in a kingdom <laughs> by no means. But I remember when I first started off on my Dharma studies and went to India at age 23 to study Tibetan language, my my parent, my father was like, what are you going to do with that? You know, but I was, I was like, I have to get free of suffering. And um, just the other day I was hanging out with him and I'm like, see, it, it worked out. I'm <laughs> I, somehow it worked out. I, I might not be completely free, but I am, you know, doing what I love. And um, so I think we have to trust ourselves with that. And we might not always know where we're going or I have a 22 year old who just graduated from UCLA and is having a hard time getting a job, right? Because they have no experience, barely any experience. Uh, and, and yet, so I was trying to convey to them that you might not know why that internship or that waiter hosting job or how it will play into your life's calling, but trust that in some way things will all add up and uh those skills that that we learn doing things that seem to be random but we followed our heart to do it fall into place and help us um live a life that feels more uh meaningful to uh, to ourselves i find that the the buddha story is so inspiring because it's so easy to get you know, with all the scandals out there, uh, with teachers not being as integral as the Buddha was himself, or there's a feeling of like in the good old days, maybe the teachers brought these teachings more to realization, but now we're in the Kali Yuga, the degenerate age, mm -hmm. where, you know, people are abusing their spiritual power for mm -hmm. you know, monetary means or sexual gratification and there's a lot of that out there right now i mean that's a thing and i kind of think as the patriarchal wall begins to crumble because it is um, a lot of those things will be exposed and hopefully something better will come of it um so i i find these stories um kind of beautiful and innocent and inspiring and uh I think that we can always turn back to the life stories of the Buddha for for um the authentic inspiration, no matter you know whether we're we identify as a woman or a man, you know I mean it's these stories of the Buddha tend to be very um, um what is the word for not patriarchal, but yeah, they're patriarchal, but the word, uh, I'm forgetting the word. It's a great word. It's, it's, you know, male centric. So sometimes yeah. I feel a little frustrated with them, but I also, the Buddha was, was a justice guy and he mm -hmm. pressed. The interesting story about his view with women is that he always said that from the beginning that women have equal capacity as men, but that he in in the beginning didn't want to ordain women because he felt that having women in the sangha might um a invite sexual misconduct between the monastics and b you know not um maintain a certain degree of clout that he felt like he had to have in order to establish Buddhism, uh, Dharma as a viable path, because it was new and he was going against the grain. But when he was pressed by Ananda, one of his primary attendants, why aren't you letting women in? Why are you your, your, your ex-wife, your mother, stepmother, want to be ordained because his birth mother died seven days after he was born? Why? And he said, well, I actually don't have a good reason apart from what I just said. And he actually changed his mind. And they say that that story is the only instance where the Buddha changed his mind out of all hmm. the stories. He changed his mind to allow women into the order and to ordain them. And he ordained, okay. I think it was his stepmother who was the first nun, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So all of these, these stories are helpful. 
but I want to see more stories, including women too, right? So they exist. And there's a wonderful book called uh, Stars at Dawn by Wendy Garling. That could be a good book for us to read after this, even if we wanted to. Mm. Or I would encourage people to read it alongside of this as mm-hmm. well. Uh, called Stars at Dawn by Wendy Garling. Hmm. Yeah. She uncovers uh, untold stories of women during the time of the Buddha's life, playing mm-hmm. a role in, in the Dharma. It's a very good book. I used it for some of my research for, for my book. I appreciate her work a lot. I'll type that in the in the chat. But those, so those are some of my musings, Eve. <laughs> I hope that's yeah. been too long. Yeah, yeah. Curious mm-hmm. to I think group I, too. Yeah. And, and there's a the there's a picture. mic right there if you don't mind. Thank you. I wanted to offer also the first free women, which is a collection of the enlightenment poems of the first enlightened women and yes. fucking amazing. Oh, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, say the title again. The first, the first free women. Yeah. I'll type it. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, last time, Chandra, we were talking a bit about, you know, how Buddha was, you know, from day one, um, essentially inviting um, folks of different castes to enter the Sangha. And that was a yeah. revolutionary act he was willing to um, yes. disrupt. But for he believed, and probably rightly, that including women was too radical. Uh, and it would disrupt his ability to teach, as you said, and that the the Sangha wouldn't have any support. But it is interesting here. It was, and yes, it's in, not that it, I mean, maybe it would in, interrupt his capacity to teach. But I want to refine what I said, because I wasn't totally thorough. It was that he felt that the longevity mm. of the of the Dharma would die out, that it wouldn't have a long lasting um uh, mm life if women were in the order isn't that interesting hmm. be short yeah. in this book the way it's framed is um that he he worried society would be not ready and yeah. that they and so they would like already you know in the last chapters here spoiler alert <laughs> there's so much jealousy among other sanghas right and yeah. as i've spoken about in the first chapters of this book at this time there were many different Um, groups of people seeking spiritual practice in many different ways, Mm -hmm. worshiping fire, you know, worshiping, you know, total asceticism of putting nothing in the body. And we see that now (laughs) there are a lot of churches that people are praying at, right. Whether it's CrossFit or um, (laughs) uh, no, no dissing. Seriously. I I think people do have a spiritual practice with that kind of community, a lot of different ways. And unfortunately at that time, the competition was really strong and there was <clears throat> gossip and, you know, um, that at least is what we hear <clears throat> here. And I, I do think Yasodhara has given a really interesting role here. I know she's written about differently in, in different texts. And in this one, it says, you know, she understood Siddhartha's longings and she had faith that if Siddhartha resolved to find the path of liberation, he would succeed. But she was also practical. Such a search could last months and even years. In the meantime, suffering would continue to unfold. So she believed it was important to respond right in the present moment. Um, And she discussed with Siddhartha ways to ease the suffering of the poorest members of society. And she'd been doing that work for years. Um, And it's interesting that, you know, he understood her need to engage in social action, but but he also understood the value of her work. And he felt that her path alone could not bring peace, that um, people were entrapped not only by illness and unjust social conditions, but by the sorrows and passions they themselves created in their own hearts and minds. And if in time, Yasodhara fell victim to fear, anger, bitterness, or disappointment, where would she find the energy she needed to continue her work? Mm -hmm. So this is, I think we talked a little bit about last time, Mm -hmm. why just going out and you know, applying oneself to the many, many, many areas of our society that need support. We can't just do that. That is the recipe for burnout. We have to be transforming the heart and mind to really have that larger um, frame in mind. Um, He said he knew that attainment of inner peace would be the only basis for true social work. Well, he says social work in there. 
there's a couple of social workers in the room. So I'm really hollering out. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't tell her cause he, he, he worried it would make her just worried. Um, yeah. So I think it's, and, and, and his stepmother, Gotami, um, also the minute she, first time she visited uh, one of these villages was Asadahara. She dedicated herself also to this path. So. Yes, no. Um, I just want to say that we have that book in our library. Mm. And I believe there's a copy of it on the free shelf out front. Don't all run and get it now. But um, The first free women. Sorry. Cool. Um, something that struck me in the story that I think is related to what you were just saying is it, it's a very and the very last part you read, not just now, but when you first were reading mm. that Siddhartha was saying when his father was like, well, why don't you state your opinion or, you know, and he said something about not being ready yet, like he saw problems, but he didn't have a solution, it, but also he was there's a way that it felt like he didn't, he didn't, maybe I'm reading this into it, but there was something about not pushing people into something like, mm. like pushing is not the way forward, right. you know? And, and so that, I feel like that's, um, yeah. I mean, he, he ended up, as we know, being not someone who, tells everyone what to do but yeah. someone who shows by example That's right right yeah yeah who really shows by example yeah. like many many times in this book he will you know encounter a uh, mass murderer or a, a simple peasant woman who's lost her child or whomever and just the presence of being held in love and we talked about that earlier for those of us who've been fortunate to meet pretty people pretty far along on their path being in their presence is like it's like you fall into their hearts through their eyes and you're, it's an amazing feeling. And that's much better than saying, why are you so petty and corrupt, right? <laughs> Showing up with the alternative. And I think he says, right now I can only point out the disease. Yeah. But I have, I have a burning question. I mean, because you're talking, he was talking about transforming the heart and the, the mind, but at the same time, he was carrying out some, changes yeah. like this thing of including the cast and women and whatever so i'm wondering i you know i'm think i can't help but thinking about like gandhi or martin luther king or people who my god you know brought about such transformations but they paid a price yeah you know they they had a sacrifice and i'm wondering whether this book at some point talks about whether the buddha gets into any kind of trouble i mean as far as i know i mean he died peacefully so you know i'm just wondering if if oh there's any any time they yeah. they talk yeah. about like yes okay. yeah it's no spoiler alert but it, it's really hard yeah you know it's it is really hard for him to go on this path and very soon we'll see him you know walk out on his like six month old child yeah right and of course that's hard on the on yasa Dahara, but also on him and many years of struggling. Um, I know we are we're almost at time here. I, I want to just share what the last quote here from Yasu Tahara when she's in the village and she's been caring for this one child in particular and nothing she did could help and the child dies, right? As so many times we do everything we can and we can't avoid um, the suffering of the world. And she said, each day I see how true all the things you have said are. My two hands are so small compared to the immensity of suffering. My heart is constantly filled with anxiety and sorrow. Please show me how I can overcome the suffering of my heart. Um, and so it's, you know, it's right at that moment when he says, you know, I'm, I am seeking this path. And they've already started a sitting practice together. They sit together in the morning. Um, and he says that I have not seen the way yet, but I feel sure that I will find a way. Please have faith in me. And then she discloses that uh, 
now's not the right time because I'm about to have a kid. <laughs> and he, you know, he just was, he said, Siddhartha felt the ties that bound him to life in the palace tightening. And I don't know about you all, I, I was about to be on a three month, not three month, three week retreat starting next week. And I felt a bit of the, uh, the ties that bind me and I'm going on a one week retreat. But it's so hard for us to prioritize the work of meditation and waking up. And, you know, I think it's it's really inspiring to think about what we what we have to do in order to seek that. And in some cases, you know, letting down, um, I wouldn't say leaving your three month old child, but, um, you know, letting down a lot of the conventional reality expectations of what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. Um, I, I do wanna say that there's a couple announcements and there's also an opportunity tonight um, on New Year's Eve. And then on our next Wednesday, which will be the fourth, we'll be doing a intention setting ceremony for the year here um, on that Wednesday night. And I know that uh, some of you know Tig O'Malley, who's a wonderful teacher and designer and maker of a lot of beauty in this space. And he had a vision for us, including um, handwritten tags here and what they would represent here for us to share if we, if we care to do so after tonight is reflecting on something we're grateful for in the year that has passed and considering an intention for the year ahead. And so um, Karen will be handing out those tags for those who are interested. And Mace has a couple announcements before we dedicate our merit. The tags are up here on the desk. Uh, there's lots of mm -hmm. Hi, crew. I'm Mace. I'm a volunteer here, and you can be too. Um, so that's super fun. Um, and I just want to remind every well, we have a couple sweet things for tonight. So we have the tags and some Sharpies and there's little tiny microscopic strings to tie to the little LED sparkle lights. And then there's also some stickers up there. So please, everyone take a sticker and there's more. If there's one that you really love and someone else gets it, let me know. And then there's also little tiny beeswax candles because it's solstice and it's important to remember the light and to call it forward if you would like to take a candle. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the opportunity to donate to the center and to our beautiful teachers and to the beautiful teachings. Mm -hmm. um, we really do need your donations. We've been, we've been doing pretty well because we didn't have a physical space for a while when the pandemic closed us down. And so not paying rent in the mission was beneficial to the collective, but now we're paying rent. And we have all these AV technical things and we've got all this stuff going. So it's really helpful. Um, Venmo for some reason decided not to work today because technology is impermanent. And so we have PayPal and we actually take cash. And like there's other, you know, people, I think some people still have checks, but, um, and the Venmo will be fixed, but it would be really wonderful if people could consider donating. If you donate on one of the electronic forms, let um put like a little note even chandra and the date because that helps the dharma collective get the um get our teachers their money and it's just a really important way to keep this space alive and well and thriving mm -hmm. um so is volunteering time um and then please check the calendar because there are some cancellations for the week the holiday week so we will not be meeting as a group next Wednesday night. And there's a couple other cancellations. The New Year's Eve gathering is from nine until midnight in this space. And there'll be food. It's family friendly. It's absolutely substance, um, mind altering, substance free besides meditation. Um, and so, yeah, check check the other cancellations. The Queer Sangha is meeting this weekend and it has a different Zoom link and it's hybrid. Um, and I think that's it. Saturday. No online and no in person. Okay, so I don't know if folks online could hear that. Where our recovery and Dharma Friday and Sunday are meeting this week, and so is the Friday night peer um, sangha relational Dharma hangout and practice together and be sangha. So, and the morning meditate every morning, including Christmas. Yes, great. Wow. So both in the space and 
on the Zooms. Hmm. That's so wonderful. Great. Yeah. So those are my announcements. So come get tags, candles, stickers, and drop off some cash. We'll just do one moment of uh, dedicating the merit here. So, so yeah, just taking a moment to turn our gaze inward and see if we can still feel that sense of candlelight. that inner illumination. And to conclude our practice here together, consider this possibility that any of our effort and presence here tonight, that it could be of benefit. And imagining as though we could really share that benefit out, like radiating out that candlelight from within. And considering these very simple and beautiful phrases, this aspiration coming from this heartfelt recognition of the suffering and challenges in the world. And dedicating ourselves in this practice that all beings would be healthy and strong that all beings would know love and belonging, that all beings would be free. <laughs>